Hi everyone, I'm Chris Howard and this is Top of Mind. This is the third in a series of conversations about generative AI. It might not be the last, it depends what is on people's minds and my mind the next couple of weeks and the weeks after that. And so it's not going away anytime soon, I can tell you that. Uh, just one thing, I do read all the comments that you put into the field below there. So feel free to add ideas you'd like me to talk about or just have conversation amongst yourself. Push on what I'm saying, disagree with me. I find that really useful and it sharpens my thinking too. In this episode, I want to do four things. I want to talk about the uses for this technology. I want to talk about the tension about whether this replaces humans or not. I want to talk about the risks because there are several. And I also want to talk a little bit about governance because that's been in the news recently. Okay, so the uses of generative AI. Last time we talked in some depth about prompt engineering and those types of, of design patterns. I'm not gonna do that exactly this time. I want you to think about this in two ways. Is this kind of technology creates new material, right? So we talked about it being a prediction machine and knowing kind of the way, the order of things and then creating new combinations of, of novel ideas. And so it can create material, innovative material, or it can help you understand material that you already have. And so we've been talking a lot about text in this case. And so text to do, you know, create a poem in the style of E.E. E. Cummings around some topic. Uh, or maybe you're asking it to summarize some existing text or help you find an idea or you ask it questions, those types of things. Uh, interestingly, you can also show it pictures of, of uh, maybe food ingredients and it will give you a recipe. So it's generating ideas from the things that, that you give it. Uh, but it's not just text, right? So I just, that was an image example. The other things I'm seeing as I talk to clients have more to do with other media types. And so it might be audio, visual, uh, but it's also used for materials design, say in the creation of new designs for aircraft parts, for example, um, as well as in pharmaceuticals for the development of new drugs. So you're actually using the chemistry in the model and looking for new patterns there. And that is starting to produce ideas for maybe new therapeutics. So it's generating new ideas and it's also helping you understand the ideas that you already have so that you could actually use them in different ways. So that leads us to a conversation that's top of mind for many people that I talk about. Is this thing gonna replace people in what they do? And it's a complicated answer. There are certainly risks that need to be addressed. This is a big part of the screenwriters strike in Los Angeles and Hollywood right now, because there's a very real risk to them that this kind of technology can produce screenplays, can produce first drafts and so on. And then they're, of course, they're concerned, concerned about that efficiency leading to lack of work for them. Ultimately, though, what artists tend to do is they learn how to use this technology to actually increase their output or to up their game. So think about maybe in sports, if you're playing against an opponent that's really good, it tends to raise your level as well. And that's the opportunity here. So even in Hollywood, you saw this movement towards computer generated uh, images on screen, so CGI. And that displaced the traditional animators, but animators learned how to use that technology to create even better, more immersive types of experience. And so we see this kind of thing throughout history where technology actually augments or assists in the output of material. You can go back into the painter's studios of the 17th century, like the school of Rembrandt. Rembrandt had people that learned his style and then would create works that looked like Rembrandt works. It was a way of scaling the capital within the, the studio. Now, experts can go back and look at that and say, yeah, I can tell this is from the school of Rembrandt. It's not actually a Rembrandt. The other thing, of course, you see that I'm coming to you from my music studio. And some of you that follow me, of course, know that I sometimes post from the studio and so on. But I have learned to embrace pretty high technology stuff in the creation of music, and I don't feel threatened by that. I feel it actually increases my innovative potential because it's helping me to do things that I otherwise couldn't do. I don't feel like I'm going to be displaced by that. Artists, in their own way, become really interesting because they break the patterns that are expected. This type of technology tends to recreate the patterns that are expected. So creative individuals, whatever your domain, this is a kind of technology that can really help you to even do better. So let's talk a little bit about risk. And this is a giant topic and we'll have much more to say on it. Uh, and they're the ones that are really familiar. So it hallucinates, it tends to make stuff up. Uh, and this is true even in images. I saw a really weird one this week where it was told to create a, uh, you know, a, a set of four young 
uh, movie producer sitting on the beach in Cannes discussing a movie. And at first glance, it looks very realistic until you realize that a couple of people have three legs. And so it's creating something that's missing. It, it's like doing something just a bit odd. And so that's a hallucination. Funny one, perhaps, but the other hallucinations could be dangerous. So, for example, maybe it's advising you to do something that is, is harmful. Now, there are filters in place to keep that from happening, but you can still trick it into having it tell you dangerous things. There are a couple of other risks that maybe are more psychological in nature that I want us to pay attention to. One is that the answers that are produced by these systems are often adequate. So they seem good enough. They may not be entirely accurate, but maybe they're adequate. And of course, human behavior is to be okay with adequacy, maybe in favor of accuracy sometimes. If they're wanting a quick answer, if they're wanting something really, you know, sort of in the moment, they're willing to make do with the adequate. So that is a, a potential risk if you're trying to give very specific advice, for example. The other thing is that these tools are, they tend to form themselves to your conversations. They tend to be more affirmational as opposed to challenging you. And so it may be that it starts to tune itself to your language and then lulls you in to believing that it is maybe supporting what you're thinking. Unfortunately, this can lead to suicide, as we've seen in some news cases, uh, or otherwise it may cause you to miss the broader dimension of a problem because you've become, you have an affirmation bias in your interaction with these types of technologies. So let's finish up by talking about governance. Governance maybe is a bit of a paradox for some people in that good governance actually enables better innovation. So if you have constraints and safety and guardrails, that actually gives you the space within which you can innovate and start to produce results. The challenge with this technology is that there isn't a lot of it. Uh, that's why there's been so much activity at the government level lately on Capitol Hill, at the OECD, in Europe, the World Economic Forum, and other places, trying to tackle the impact of this technology on society and how to get in front of that. So it's a very active conversation. I think it's a really important one because this technology does have risks that actually start to affect society. In a way, that's why Jeffrey Hinton left Google some time ago so that he could speak more freely about the fears that he has. So the existential fears is the word that I don't use lightly and he doesn't either. Because the concern is that we create a capability that ultimately is smarter than humans are and then the potential risks that come along with that. So you maybe remember last time I talked about my Australian shepherds and the fact that they come out packed with energy, you give them some vocal cues and they learn how to do complex herding tasks, but they also figure out how to solve problems in the field that they weren't trained to solve. They just sort of understand the whole, the whole set. That's in a way the way that these technologies work in that they're trained to solve problems and then they find really efficient ways to do that. And of course, the subtext to Jeffrey Hinton's concern is what happens when people become the problem that the technology is trying to solve? There's a lot more to say about that. And I'm really eager to actually hear your conversation. So be active in the comments and interact with one another. So this has been Top of Mind with Chris Howard. And I hope you join me in a couple of weeks time and we'll keep talking about this and other topics that are interesting to you.